Well, thank you very much uh, for that kind of introduction and to the committee, including Dr. Gold, for, uh, for the honor of the invitation to present. Um, I do uh, facial plastic surgery in the U.S. and the Midwest um, and want to talk about how we complement our facelift results with uh, fat transfer in order to achieve what, I, what my goal is, which is optimum uh, rejuvenation. So by way of disclosures, I'm a trainer for both Allergan and, uh, uh, and Galderma, uh, but I received no support for this meeting. I like the split face model because you can really see, I think, the role of, um, of volume uh, uh, depletion in aging process uh, as opposed to simply, as opposed to just descent of the tissues. Um, and so it, it really highlights the need for volume restoration in order to achieve the, the maximum results. In fact, along the jawline, you can see that um, it, ptosis is probably less um, of an issue relative to volume loss with the decreased volume in the pregial sulcus which could be augmented to more better uh, equate symmetry to the other side. In particular, uh, interest to me is the uh, peri periorbital area um, and not, not only soft tissue uh, loss in this area but also uh, bony atrophy causes a radial expansion of the orbit uh, which then leads to um, hollowness uh, in the orbit as we see here. And if we only address uh, surgically the the, um, uh, some perceived descent of the brow, which I think is largely over, uh, over evaluated, um, then we miss out on that uh, potential for volume restoration for more natural rejuvenation back to the earlier years. And what do the earlier years look like? Well, if you look at a baby's face, then it's uh, dominated by highlights, particularly in the subbrow area and the uh, inferorbital uh, area. Um, you see a uh, elimination of the, or, or, or lack of upper lid show, maybe there's only a millimeter or two of upper lid show, um, a nice highlight beneath the brow, and, uh, and not an elevated brow. Again, a mother-daughter combo, and uh, one of the interesting things about this is that the daughter's brow is actually lower and angled downward relative to the mother's. You could argue that the, uh, the mother's brow is more aesthetically pleasing, but regardless, it's not necessarily uh, a younger brow. So a typical patient that presents for, uh, for rejuvenation, uh, and we uh, can see it as aging advances, the loss of volume, in the, it starts in the medial superorbital area, and then sort of advances across, typically. Uh, sometimes patients have a more uh, dominant um, skin component, but frequently there's uh, at least a partial volume loss, which occurs, and uh, this is a typical marking for a patient that uh, is going to uh, uh, receive uh, volume restoration through fat transfer, which is our choice for surgical uh, volume restoration. It can be a standalone and it can be easily incorporated with, uh, with other procedures, um, but it, as compared to surgical implants, it's much more customizable. Uh, and I have yet to see a surgical implant for the superorbital rim, uh, where I like to uh, inject fat now as well. So uh, superorbital region, inferorbital region, and then blending into the temples as well, judiciously. So after fat transfer, we, we did about three cc's for the superorbital rim, three cc's for the inferorbital rim, and three cc's for the anterior lateral cheeks, and then additionally for the lower face, but I want to kind of focus on the periorbital region uh, for this talk. Um, and uh, we also do a lot of injectable fillers, and probably about a third uh, uh, the volume would be used for each of these locations for synthetic fillers. So does it last? Well, four years after fat transfer, this patient I think had a, reten a nice retention of volume, um, effacement of the upper lid, uh, and the so-called sulcus deformity uh, of the upper lid there, notching near the superorbital and supertrochlear vessels, um, and uh, improvement of the uh, hollowness in the inferorbital region as well. No blepharoplasty was performed. She did have skin rejuvenation by a dermatology colleague. How do we do it? Uh, we harvest gently with a 10 cc syringe. Uh, only about one or two cc's of back traction on the plunger uh, relative to the level of the fat, um, and uh, then process it through centrifugation for three minutes at 3,000 RPMs. Discard the supernatant and infra infranatant and just keep the nice yellow uh, fat in the middle. Transfer that to one cc syringes and then inject it using 0.9 and 1.2 millimeter cannulae. Uh, we also inject only about 0.1 cc's per two to five passes, so it's a very slow, careful uh, process. Uh, but I think uh, we can get nice results with it. It's inexpensive equipment. Uh, you can uh, obtain all the stuff that I'm talking about for probably under $1,000. Um, and uh, uh, patients are, are typically very satisfied with this. Um, it's a durable uh, uh, type of technique um, and, and result, and it's very natural for a patient who is, is wanting that natural result. 
there is longer downtime. I don't do it unless a patient is willing to accept at least a two-week downtime. Uh, so for a lot of patients, that second week uh, uh, prevents them from considering it, but, uh, but for those who do, uh, it works well, um, and they have to be able to accept the possibility, although low, of a need for a repeat procedure at a year. In our practice, it's probably 10% or less. And it's, uh, as I mentioned, easily combined with other procedures such as facelifting and eyelid surgery or as a standalone. So a few results then. Uh, our preference for facelifting is a deep plane facelift, but um, probably this patient you could achieve a, a result with, um, with a thread lift as well, uh, but because she had very mild uh, ptosis of the jaw, of the gel, um, and uh, I think uh, that straightening of the jawline was nicely complemented by the uh, volume restoration she was able to uh, achieve with infraorbital and, uh, and cheek filling. Um, the amounts were about three cc's for the infraorbital region, three for the anterior, and two for lateral cheek, uh, and a little bit in the lateral canthus. On three-quarter view, I think it's uh, nice to be able to show the, uh, the opposite cheek um, and, as well as the ipsilateral cheek, but um, at least half of her result, I think, and she thought as well. She, she was not coming in expecting to have fat transfer when she came for consult, but she was uh, at least as happy with that result as she was with the jawline straightening. Moving up to a patient with moderate atrophy um, and uh, straightening of the jawline and neck was, uh, was I think, acceptable, uh, but uh, also the improvement of the mid-face uh, was, was flattering uh, to me and to her. Um, we then subsequently did her upper eyelids um, and, and also not only with a blepharoplasty for skin removal, but also fat transfer to improve the volume in that area. So uh, combining the fat transfer with the blepharoplasty worked well for her. Um, and in this case, the volumes used were about two cc's for the superorbital rim, three for the inferorbital, and, uh, and typical amounts for the, for the cheeks. We did blend it a little bit in the temple with two cc's. Patient with more advanced atrophy, uh, no blepharoplasty was done, but yet she had improvement of that very uh, hollow mid-face uh, with fat transfer um, and uh, improvement of the upper lid exposure. Interestingly, I didn't do a brow lift on her, but she appears to have had, in some, in some ways, perhaps a brow lift. I think with the, with the highlight that you get beneath the brow, it actually makes the brow look higher up above the, uh, the lid. Um, there may also be some radial lifting component of, uh, of placing volume in the upper lid in the, in the uh, superorbital region. Uh, that, uh, that contributes to that. Uh, but uh, straightening the jawline, um, I think, complemented by the volume restoration, we used four cc's in her inferorbital region for a little bit more effect. Last one with advanced atrophy uh, and uh, even greater uh, exposure to the upper lid, and we were a little more aggressive with her. We used four cc's for the superorbital region um, and uh, four for the inferorbital region. Um, notice the pickup of the tail of the brow um, on, the, uh, on her left side which occurred, uh, and again, that was not with any surgical lifting, that was uh, just through radial expansion, so I think it, it shows what, uh, what we can do with volume regardless of the uh, material used. Um, so uh, good uh, reduction of the exposure of the upper lid um, and uh, complementing the uh, improvement of the face and neck uh, uh, tightening. So what does the future hold? Um, we're beginning to use PRP for all of our fat transfer uh, procedures, whether it's a standalone or with, uh, with other procedures. Um, and I'm mixing it about one cc of fat uh, of PRP for nine, uh, with nine of, uh, PRP, of fat. Um, we're certainly seeing no worse effect, no excessive turbocharging of the results, uh, which I was concerned about, but um, um, we may be seeing a trend toward reduction of, uh, of bruising and swelling and downtime uh, that associated, is associated with that. Um, and uh, there may be a trend toward increased durability, but we haven't run the numbers just yet. It's been about nine months since I've started doing that. What role do stem cells play? Well, those of us who do a lot of fat transfer will see an improvement in the skin quality about a year and beyond after a fat transfer. Um, and uh, there's some studies that are be beginning to show perhaps some reasons why an animal model showed uh, increased dermal thickness through collagen uh, um, production and the uh, skin under which uh, fat was placed. And so in summary, uh, fat transfer incorporates well with other procedures, face lifting, neck lifting, um, whether it's surgically or, uh, or with thread lifts or any other means. Um, and it also works well as a standalone procedure like with synthetics. Uh, it's durable, it's good for the patient who's looking for an unnatural type of result. There is a little bit longer downtime and so patients have to be willing to accept that, but there's also longer durability. Um, like all volume restoration, we have to be judi judicious with it, particularly in men uh, who don't want that overinflated, uh, perhaps Hollywood appearance. Um, and uh, if we do so, I think there's a bright future for this. Thank you very much.